Hello and welcome to Deep Learning with PyTorch 0 to GANs. You will learn deep learning using the PyTorch framework and I will be your instructor, Akash. So by the end of this course, you will be able to train a model which goes from producing random noise to fairly good images of handwritten digits and anime faces. And what's more interesting is that both of these are produced by the exact same model. The only difference is that data used to train these models is different. These are GANs or Generative Adversarial Networks and they are quite powerful and we will learn all about them starting from the very basics. Not only that, you will be able to build a real world project using deep learning and earn a verified certificate of accomplishment from Jovian. I'm really excited to kick off this course. So let's get started. The first thing you need to do is go to zero to gans.com, which will bring you to this course page. Now on the course page, you can click the enroll button to enroll for the course and share button to invite your friends. And you can see all the lessons here and the assignments. So let's open up lesson one. You will be able to catch a recording of this lesson on this page. Now on lesson one, you will find links to certain Jupyter notebooks, which we will be using to execute code live. So let's open up the first link. This is called 01 basics. This is a Jupyter notebook hosted on the Jovian platform. Let's go through it. So deep learning with PyTorch is a hands-on and beginner friendly introduction to deep learning. And this course has a few, a few small prerequisites. So if you're just getting started with data science and deep learning, you can take this tutorial series. You just need to know a little bit of programming with Python. And if you do not, you can follow these links here to learn via some tutorials and you need to know a little bit of high school mathematics. Once again, you just need to know about vectors, matrices, derivatives, and probabilities, and you can follow these links to learn about these topics. So in a couple of hours, you should be able to cover all of the prerequisites that you need for this course and any additional mathematical or theoretical concepts that we need, we will cover as we go along. There is no prior knowledge of data science or deep learning required for taking this course. So what we are looking at here right now, this is a Jupyter notebook hosted on the Jovian platform. And this is a read only view of the platform of the notebook. This is used for sharing the notebook, but if you want to run the code and if you scroll down, you will see that there is some code here. If you want to run the code, the easiest way to do that is using free online resources, but you can also run it on your computer locally and you will find some instructions here. So what you need to do is scroll up, find the run button here and click run on Colab. So this will give you an option to authorize your Google Drive access and run this notebook on Colab. So just click on authorize and you will be asked to select a Google account here where you will authorize Jovian to run notebooks onto Google Colab, an online platform for running Jupyter notebooks. So please select the first account that is listed in this list and click allow so that we can create the files within your Google Drive to run this notebook. And once you do that, this notebook will open up on colab.research.google.com. So now this Jupyter notebook, the same thing that we saw earlier here is now running here on the cloud. And we will be using this interface to run the notebooks throughout this lecture series. So the first thing I'm going to do is go edit and clear all outputs. What this does is the code that is there in this notebook already has some outputs. You may want to remove those outputs so that you can run the code and discover the outputs and study them on your own. Then let me just go full screen here and I'm also going to hide the menu bar for now. Okay, so let's get started. So what you're looking at here is a code cell. So there is a, this is a cell within a Jupyter notebook where there is some code. If you click the run button here or press shift plus enter, this will run the code for you. So make sure you run the first cell, otherwise your notebook may not function properly. And the first time you run it, it may take a minute or two just to initialize. So let's give it that time. All right. So the first cell has now executed. And then below you can see this is what is called a text or a markdown cell. So a cell can either contain some code or it can contain some explanations. And if you want to create a new cell, you just click plus code or plus text and that will create a text or code cell for you. So now we are on the first tutorial PyTorch basics 
and in this tutorial we will cover the f uh, the following topics we will learn about pytorch tensors we will learn about tensors operations and gradients we will learn about the interoperability between pytorch and numpy and we will learn how to use the pytorch documentation website and we've already seen how to run the code so we can skip ahead there is there are some instructions here to install the required libraries now if you are running on google colab you do not need to install anything everything is already installed but if you are running on your own computer or if you're picking one of the other options to run so you have an option to run on a platform called binder or on a platform called kaggle then you might need to run some of these commands so i'm just going to skip ahead because we don't need it a pytorch is already installed here so let's import pytorch and the way you import pytorch is by writing import torch so import torch imports the torch module which contains all the functionality of pytorch so now we have access to the torch module and at its core pytorch is a library for processing tensors a, a tensor is a number a vector a matrix or any n dimensional array so let's create a tensor with a single number this is how you do it you just say torch dot tensor and then you put in a number here and that we've put that result into t1 and then we've typed t1 here to display the result and you can see here that a tensor has been created so four dot or four point is a shorthand for 4.0 it is used to indicate to python and to pytorch that you want to create a floating point number and we can verify this by checking the dtype attribute of our tensor so if you type t1.dtype and run the cell so once again i'm running the cell using shift plus enter you can see here that it has the type torch.float32 now as i said a tensor can be a vector or a matrix so let's try creating some more complex tensors so here we have torch.tensor and we are passing it a list of numbers 1 2 3 and 4 and we have one dot here so that is going to convert this into a floating point number and let's see what happens to the others so what you will notice is that a tensor got created but all of the values got converted into floating point numbers so this is an important property that all the elements of a tensor have the same type so if you s check the data type now and i can do that by adding a code cell here plus code and typing t2 dot d type you can see that it has the type float 32 because all the numbers have been converted to floats so that's what is called a vector or a one dimensional tensor then we have a matrix here so here what we're doing is we are passing a list of list of numbers so there are multiple lists of numbers inside a bigger list and it forms a matrix which you might remember from linear algebra it has certain rows and columns so it has three rows and two columns and once again we've put in phi dot here because we want to convert this into a floating point number now the reason we use floating point numbers and floating point tensors for deep learning is because a lot of the operations that we will be performing will not yield integer results for example we will be doing matrix multiplications and divisions and inversions and things like that and gradients um, and so on and all of these will not produce integer results so you might face issues if you work with tensors that are integers so that is why always make sure you're creating floating point tensors so now we've created a two dimensional tensor or a matrix so here we have the same three rows and two columns next we have a three dimensional tensor so what we're doing here is well you can think of it a little bit like this you take a matrix so here we have a matrix and then you take another matrix which has the exact same number of rows and columns as this matrix and then put it behind this matrix so just think of it in three dimensions now what that will give you is that will give you a cuboid kind of a structure where you have one matrix and another matrix behind it now obviously we cannot show that on this screen while typing code so what we do is we write the matrices one below the other so here we take one matrix this is one matrix and this is the second matrix that is supposed to be behind this matrix and then we put the two of them together into a list and what that gives us is a three dimensional tensor okay so there you go that's a three dimensional tensor and tensors can have any number of dimensions and different lengths along each dimensions so we can expect the length along each dimension of a tensor using the dot shape property let's see the tensors we've created so far and their shapes so the t1 tensor was simply a number 4 so it did not really have any shape in fact it has zero dimensions it's just a number so that is why you get back an empty list here then let's check t2 which was a vector 
So T2 has one dimension. So that's why you get one element in the shape and that element has the value four indicating that there are four elements along that direction. That is the length of that direction uh, of that dimension. Next up we have T3, which was a matrix. So let's check that. Now you probably know the drill by now you have three rows and two columns. So that is why you have two elements here. The first element is three and the second element is two. Now what about T4? T4 was a three dimensional tensor. Before we run this, let's just try to figure out what the shape should be. So this is a thumb rule that you use for figuring out the shapes of tensors. Just start with the outermost bracket and first count the number of elements in the outermost bracket. So the outermost bracket has two elements, both of which are matrices. So the first element in the shape is two. Then go one bracket in and when you go one bracket in, then you see that inside this list, so this is a list which forms the matrix, there are once again two elements. So the second element in the shape will also be two. Then go one bracket in. So now we're at the innermost bracket and count the number of elements. So now you have three elements here. So the third element is three, right? So you go outside in and that is how you get the shape of a tensor. And uh, there are three brackets here. So the shape will have three elements. So let's print T4 and let's print the shape. So as we expected, it has the shape two, two and three, indicating three dimensions and the lengths two, two and three along each dimension. But note that it is not possible to create tensors with an improper shape. So if you try to create a tensor like this, where you have three rows and two columns, but the first row has a third column. This will cause an issue. This is an important difference between a list of lists and a tensor has to have a regular proper shape. Otherwise you will get back an error. The other difference being that all the elements within a tensor should have the same data type. If they do not have the same data type, they will be given the same data type while creating the tensor. Okay. So that's about tensors. Now we can combine tensors using the usual arithmetic operations that we use for numbers. So let's look at an example. Here we have X, W and B. We are creating three tensors. They have the values three, four and five respectively. Now we've added this special argument here called requires grad equals true. What's that going to do? We'll see in just a moment. So let's run this right now. So now we have X, W and B with the values three, four and five as we expected. Now, if we want to combine these tensors to create a new tensor Y, all we need to do is use the basic arithmetic operations that we already know. So just W multiplied by X. So the star indicates multiplication plus B. And you might expect this will give you three times four, 12 plus five, 17. And it gives us 17 as we expect. Now what makes PyTorch unique is that we can automatically compute the derivative of Y. Now, if you look at Y is a function of W, X and B, right? Y is W, X plus B. So you can take the derivative of Y with respect to W and let's do that mentally. So W, X plus B, the derivative of that would be the de derivative of W, X plus the derivative of B. Since with respect to W, B is a constant, that term goes away, we get back zero there and with respect to W, X is a constant. So what we get back the derivative of uh, D, the derivative of W, X with respect to W is simply X. So the derivative of Y with respect to W is simply X. Okay. And this is basic derivative calculation. If you are not finding this familiar, then just go back and review the resources related to derivatives. But DY by DW has the value X and dy by dx will have the value w in the same way and dy by db will have the value one. Okay. So now suppose we wanted to calculate all of these derivatives and why would we want these derivatives? Because the technique that we use to train the machine learning models, the deep learning models, the technique that we use to train the model to produce those images that we looked at at the beginning, that requires computation of derivatives. It involves derivatives in some way. And we'll see how today by the end of this lecture. So that's why derivatives are important. And what PyTorch provides is if you want the derivative of Y with respect to W, all you need to do is you need to call Y dot backward. So just call Y dot backward here. And when you call Y dot backward, what happens is the derivatives of Y with respect to each of the inputs. 
which is w x and b get stored in the dot grad property of the respective tensors so dy by dx should go into x dot grad dy by dw into w dot grad and dy by db into b dot grad so this is the result dy by dw should have had the value x and x itself has the value 3 so we got back 3 here that's right and dy by db had the value 1 as we calculated so that is something that we get back here as well but dy by dx has the value none now why is that now if we go back and look at the definition of x w and b we can see here that we have not specified requires grad equals to true for x but we have specified it for w and b now what this tells pytorch is that we are not interested in the derivatives of any future outputs with respect to x but we are interested in the derivatives of future outputs with respect to w and b and this is just an optimization right now we're just working with three numbers but if we were working with 3 million or 30 million we would not want to do millions or tens of millions of useless operations that will cost us time that will cost us energy as well so that's where you use the requires grad property if you set the requires grad property to true as we have done for w and b we get back these tensors which are the derivatives of y with respect to w and b okay and now the dot grad here the grad in dot grad is short for gradient which is another term for derivative and the term gradient is primarily used while dealing with vectors and matrices and their derivatives and partial derivatives and so on so that was basic tensor operations and tensor arithmetic Apart from arithmetic operations, the torch module also contains many functions for creating and manipulating tensors. So let's look at some examples here. Let's look at this example of a function called full. So you say torch.full and you give it a shape and then you give it a value and then it creates a tensor with that value with the given shape. So that value is repeated everywhere. Similarly, we have this another tensor called cat. So what this is going to do is this is going to join the tensors so it, it concatenates or joins two tensors with compatible shapes into a single tensor. So let's see what T3 was once again. So this is T3. T3 has three rows and two columns. This is T6. T6 has three rows and two columns as well. And if we do torch.cat T3, T6, we get back T7 where now we have six rows and two columns. So can you figure out how this happened? What happened exactly here? Try going through the documentation to figure this out. Then we have the sign here. So if we take T7, this is sign, or this is T7. And if we call T a torch dot sign, this could be sign, cos, there are a bunch of mathematical functions. In fact, there are close to a thousand tensor operations that are available in the library. You can compute on these tensors. So here you get back T2 dot T8 torch dot sign of T7, which is T8. So the sign of these numbers is this and what you can also do is you can take a tensor and you can retain the values the elements in the exact same order but you can simply reshape or change the shape of the tensor so here we going here we are going from a tensor with the shape one two three four five six so six comma two two we are going uh, to a tensor with the shape three comma two okay and this is now we get back a three-dimensional tensor from a two-dimensional tensor so this is also a really useful function so this is the documentation page for tensor operations you can open this up and read about some tensor operations and over the course of the assignment you will be implementing and showcasing at least five tensor operations so more on that later but right now what you can do is you can just experiment with some more tensor functions and operations using these empty cells okay so we've looked at tensors right now we have looked at tensor operations now if you are familiar with Python and a little bit of data science, you may have heard about this library called NumPy. And NumPy is a popular open source library used for mathematical and scientific computing in Python. The reason it is used is because it has a lot of functions implemented for large multi-dimensional arrays very efficiently in C++ and it has a vast ecosystem of supporting libraries. So it has this library called Pandas for file IO and data analysis. It has a library called matplotlib for plotting and visualization and OpenCV for image and video processing. Now this is a huge topic in itself, data science with Python. And if you are interested in learning more about NumPy and other data science libraries in Python, then you can check out this tutorial series. We also have a full video course that you can take 
over six weeks and you can take that course side by side by going to zero to pandas.com that is z e r o t o p a n d a s dot com now because by Py because python already has this huge data science ecosystem instead of reinventing the wheel pytorch interoperates really well with numpy to leverage its existing ecosystem of tools and libraries so this is how you create uh, so let's see how that interoperability works so this is how you create an array in numpy let's create a numpy array to begin with we import numpy as np that's a convention and then we do np dot array and give it the data that we want so just as we have created tensors we can also create numpy arrays here so there you go a numpy array has been created a 2 by 2 matrix and we can convert a numpy array into a pytorch tensor using torch dot from numpy so we call torch dot from numpy pass in the tensor x and then we get back y now let's verify that the numpy array and the torch tensor have similar data types so the numpy array has a data type well numpy array we we have not seen the data type but you can check it using x dot d type and y dot d type is going to give you the data type of the tensor so they do not have the same data type float64 in numpy is slightly different and torch dot float64 both are implemented internally differently but they correspond to similar kinds of numbers and that's the important thing here so for each data type in numpy there's a corresponding data type in pytorch and vice versa now what we can do is uh, now we take our tensor and then we do some machine learning with it with some deep learning with it we train some models we put it on a gpu we perform a lot of computations and then we want to get back some results out into numpy so what we can do is we simply call the dot numpy method of a tensor and that gives us back now this interoperability between pytorch and numpy is essential because most of the data sets that you work with will likely be read and processed using numpy arrays and any data analysis course or tutorial you take will be using numpy so you might wonder at this point why we need a library like pytorch at all since numpy provides all the data structures and utilities for working with multi dimensional data right so there are two main reasons here one is autograd which is the ability of pytorch to automatically compute gradients for tensor operations this is essential for deep learning and the second is gpu support so when we are working with massive data sets and large models which is gbs and gbs of data pytorch tensor operations can be performed very efficiently using graphics processing units or gpus and computations that might typically take hours on a cpu despite using the efficient functions from numpy they can be completed within minutes using gpus and what we will do over the course of this series is leverage each of these things quite extensively so that completes our discussion of tensors and at this point what you should be doing is to save this notebook so what you're looking at right now google colab this is going to shut down after some time this is running on the cloud and this is stored privately in your google account now what you can do is you can take this notebook and put it onto your jovian account the same account that you used that you created while enrolling for the course or while running this notebook so all you need to do to put this notebook onto your jovian account is run pip install jovian so this is going to install the jovian python library import the jovian library and then say jovian dot commit and give it a project name so here i'm going to give it the project name 0201 pytorch basics live because i don't want to affect the notebook that i already had now if you already this project already exists then it will simply create a new version in the project so i just want to create a new project here pytorch basics live and when you create this project uh, when you run jovian dot commit you will be asked to enter an api key so just go to your jovian account which is jovian dot ai and click on the copy api key button come back here and paste the api key and this will take your notebook from google colab and it will put it onto jovian so now you see here now this is a read only version of the notebook uh, you cannot run the code here nobody can modify your code here but what you can do is you can take this link and share it with anyone and you can this is also part of your profile so you can come back and run this code later on whenever you need to if you've done half your work keep running jovian dot commit from time to time in your notebooks and you can come back and you can rerun your code and continue every time you run jovian dot commit in colab it will save a new version of the notebook on the same project so just to summarize what we've learned here this tutorial covers 
introduction to pytorch tensors tensor operations and gradients and interoperability between pytorch and numpy now this is all fairly simple stuff but we are learning this because this is giving us the foundation to pick up and learn the next topic which is gradient descent and linear regression so let me open that up now one thing you can do here is there are a bunch of questions almost 30 32 questions here at the end of this notebook so if you want to test your understanding just try answering these questions or maybe start a new blank notebook and copy paste each question and then type the answer out or write some code which produces the answer that is a great way to test your understanding so let's move on now we are on the second notebook zero to linear regression this is linked from the first notebook or you can also come back to the course page and find the link here once again this is a Jupyter notebook hosted on Jovian so what we need to do now is to run the code to run the code we are going to click run and then select run on Colab now once you've already authorized Colab you will not need to authorize it again it will simply run the notebook for you so here we have it the notebook is now running I am just going to go to edit and clear all the outputs now a quick tip before we get into this notebook is if you're watching us live then you can just sit through and watch the tutorial right now and then you can go back and watch the recording and pause it wherever you need while you're experimenting with the notebook it's also a good idea to just skip ahead to the next cell and just run the code see what happens and if you don't understand just come back to the video and watch it now if you have questions at any point then what you can do is go back to the course page so you have go to zero to gans.com open up the lecture lesson one and on lesson one you will find the link to a course discussion forum so just click the course discussion forum here this will bring you to the discussion forum where you can ask questions so there is a topic here for this live stream so you can just open up this discussion topic this thread and press the reply button there's a reply button at the bottom just press the button and you will be able to ask a question and somebody from the community or from the course team is going to answer the question for you participating in the community is actually a big part of this course we've had thousands of people asking and answering questions and you can learn a lot simply by reading the questions and the answers so do check out the community forum and do ask questions and answer them okay so getting back to our linear regression notebook we have cleared all the outputs and now we are ready to start running the code once again I will run the first cell to make sure everything works properly this is going to start the server for us Jupyter in the background and start initialize the server and run the first cell of code for and now we are on our second topic already gradient descent and linear regression with PyTorch and this tutorial we are going to cover these topics we are going to understand what linear regression and gradient descent mean we are going to implement a linear regression model using PyTorch tensors and we're going to train a linear regression model using the gradient descent algorithm and we will implement the gradient descent algorithm not just from basic tensor operations but also using PyTorch built-ins so first we learn all the nitty-gritties all the different things involved in implementing things from scratch and then we'll see how easy PyTorch makes us um, makes it for us to perform all of these computations with just a few lines of code okay and linear regression is in fact one of the foundational algorithms in machine learning if you take any machine learning course they will almost always begin with linear regression and so is the case for deep learning in fact linear regression is very closely related to what you do in deep learning make sure to understand it properly ask questions rewatch the video run the notebook uh, but make sure that you understand linear regression and gradient descent and that will set you up really well for the rest of the course now what we'll do is we will take an example problem and work through it to understand what linear regression is so we will create a model that predicts crop yields for apples and oranges so these are called the target variables and we will this model will predict these crop yields by looking at the average temperature rainfall and humidity in a region and these are called the input variables so here is some training data let's suppose we've gone to five regions we've done surveys over the past few years and we've come up with this information that in the Canto region the, the temperature was 73 degrees Fahrenheit the average temperature the rainfall was 67 and the humidity was 43 percent over a year and with these average values we had 56 tons per hectare of apples produced and 70 tons per hectare of oranges produced 
So that was the yield of apples and oranges. And similarly, we've done this exercise for four other regions. So now we have what is called this training data. So in a linear regression model, each target variable is estimated to be a weighted sum of the input variables offset by some constant. This is what that looks like. So you have the yield of apples is some number, some weight W11 multiplied by temperature, W12 multiplied by rainfall, W13 multiplied by humidity plus B1. So I understand these weighted, why we have these weighted averages because in a sense you are saying how important each of temperature, rainfall and humidity are in determining the yield of apples. But what about B1? This is a very simple trick. Suppose temperature, rainfall and humidity are all zero, which may not happen in real life, but suppose they were, even if they did get to that point, the yield of apples still would not be zero. There would still be a non-zero yield or it may be negative or we may need some kind of an adjustment factor and that is why we have this constant and this constant is called the bias. Okay. So the yield of apples is, is a linear combination of the temperature, rainfall and humidity using some weights and a bias. Similarly, the yield of oranges is another linear combination of temperature, rainfall and humidity. Uh, but this time we are using different weights. And visually what this means is if you plotted the temperature and rainfall on two axes and then the apples on the third axis and we are not looking at humidity here because it is not possible to plot in four dimensions. So we can only plot three dimensions here. So we have temperature and rainfall and what this is saying is as the rainfall increases, the yield of apples increases and as the temperature increases, the yield of apple also increases. Now this is obviously not strictly true. If the temperature gets really high, then there will be no crop. Everything will be so uh, dry. Everything, all plants will die. And if the rainfall gets really high, that is going to affect the crop as well. So there will be a crop failure in both those conditions. But what we say when, and that is why this is called a model and this is not the truth or the real relationship or a physical law. What we say is that within reasonable values of temperature, rainfall and humidity, there is roughly speaking a linear relationship between the yield of apples and these input variables. That's what we mean here. And now the learning part of linear regression is to figure out a good set of weights W11, 12, 13, 212, 223 and biases B1 and B. Sometimes weights and biases together are just called weights. So you will see them being used interchangeably. So the learning part of linear regression is to figure out a good set of weights using the training data so that we can make accurate predictions for the new data. So once we have figured out a good set of weights, then we can go to a sixth region. And if we know the temperature, rainfall and humidity for that region, let's say we've estimated that for the next year using some weather analysis, then we can predict what the yield of apples and oranges in that region is going to be. And that might be a very useful thing because depending on the demand, you can then decide what to plant more of, how much area you should allocate for apples and oranges, what the prices should be and so on. And this is a real world example that happens all the time, prediction of crop yields using weather especially. So that's what the learning process involves, figuring out, out a good set of weights. And the way we will do this is we will train our model. We'll train our model by adjusting the weights slightly many times. So we we'll start out with random weights. Our model will do very badly. It will make bad predictions, but we will improve the weight slowly using an optimization technique called gradient descent which is at the heart of not just linear regression, but all of deep learning. So let's begin by importing NumPy and PyTorch. So now here we have the training data, the table that you saw earlier that can be represented using two matrices, inputs and targets. So here we have the input matrix. The input matrix is we are representing it using a NumPy array, a NumPy array because this is somewhat closer to the real world scenario where somebody will send you an Excel file or a CSV and you will read that Excel file in using the NumPy or Pandas libraries and you will get back a NumPy array ultimately. And we learn about those things over the next few lessons and assignments. But for now, we've assumed that somehow we have put together a NumPy array containing all the input variables. So we have one row for each region and then we have one column for temperature, one for rainfall and one for humidity. And these are the exact same values that you saw earlier. Now one way to convert this into floating point numbers is to just put a dot here. And the other way is to just specify a data type explicitly here. 
Okay, and we use floating point numbers because we are going to be doing a lot of matrix operations which will involve decimals, which will not all be integers. So let's create a NumPy array here. And then we can create another NumPy array for the targets. So once again, for the five regions, we have the yield of apples and the yield of oranges in tons per hectare. So that is what is captured here using this five by two matrix. Once again, this is a float 32 matrix. Now we have treated, we have separated out the inputs and the targets because we will be operating on them separately. Now we will be doing some matrix operations and so on. So let's convert these arrays into PyTorch tensors. We say torch dot from numpy inputs and torch dot from numpy targets. Now these are PyTorch. Next, we need to create our linear regression model. To create a linear regression model, the first thing we need are the weights and the biases. And the weights and the biases can be represented as matrices. So let's see how. If you look at this expression here, you have W11, W12, 13, 21, 22, 23. If you simply hide the temperature, rainfall, humidity, just put them away, put all the operators away for a moment. You can see that this kind of forms a matrix where it has two rows and it has three elements, right? So this is a two row by three element by three column matrix. And then the biases B1 and B2, they form a vector. So what we'll do is we will initialize the weights as a matrix and we will initialize the biases as a vector. And we will initialize them with random values because we don't know what good weights are, what are the right weights for this relationship. So we can say torch.randn. Rand n is simply going to create a torch tensor with the given shape. So the shape that we are passing is two comma three, two rows and three columns, a matrix. And we will set requires grad set to true. And we'll see why this is useful later. Then we also have torch.randn2. This is going to create a bias vector with b1 and b2. And this will set requires grad to true as well. And let's print w and b. So torch.randn creates the tensor with a given shape and the elements are picked randomly from a normal distribution. If you don't know what a normal distribution is, don't worry about it. All that means is the numbers will roughly come from the range minus one to one or minus two to two and they will be randomly chosen. Now that we have the weights, our model is simply a function that performs a matrix multiplication of the inputs and the weights transposed. So let's see what that means. So this is one row from our input matrix. This is the whole input matrix and look at the first row, 73, 67, 43, temperature, rainfall and humidity. Now if we take the weights matrix and then we transpose the weights matrix, so the first row now becomes the first column and let's just concentrate on the first column for now. When we perform a matrix multiplication, this element gets multiplied with this, 67 gets multiplied with W12 and 43 gets multiplied with W13. And together then they get added up. So we get 73 W11 plus 67 W12 plus 43 W13. And that's exactly what we had defined as our linear regression model. And then if we just add a plus here and then add a bias. So then B1 also gets added to it. So this expression, which is, which takes a five by three matrix, multiplies it with a three by two matrix. So that gives us a five by two matrix. And then it adds another five by two matrix to it. So overall, all of this put together gives us a five row by two column matrix. This expression will give us the predictions of the model. So this expression, let's, see what that gives us. We take the inputs and then we say we want to do a matrix multiplication. So for the matrix multiplication, we use the expression at the at character represents matrix multiplication in PyTorch. Then we call W dot T. So that is going to transpose the weights matrix. Remember we need it. We need the rows to become columns and columns to become rows. And then we add the bias terms. So let's see what that, that gives us this tensor and what this tensor represents is if you look at the inputs once again, it represents for this input, for this temperature, rainfall and humidity, what is temperature times W11 plus rainfall times W12 plus humidity times W13 plus B1, which is the prediction of the model for the yield of apples in the first region. Similarly, this becomes the prediction of the model for the yield of apples in the second region. Oh, sorry for the yield of oranges in the first region. So this is, the, this is for each row or for each 
row of input for each region, we get back one row of output, which is the prediction of the model for that region for apples and oranges. And similarly, these are the predictions for the other regions. So five regions, we get back five times two, 10 predictions. Okay. And that's all it is. That is our machine learning model. It takes the input, performs a matrix multiplication, adds some bias and churns out an output. Uh, this is how our model makes predictions. Obviously it's going to be pretty bad because our weights are pretty bad, but we'll see what to do about that. So we're just going to define it as a function. We are going to define a function model so that we can give it different sets of inputs. We can give it one input, two input, five inputs, new inputs and so on. So it takes the input matrix and it performs a matrix multiplication with the weights transposed and it adds the bias. So we've defined a function here. Now let's pass the inputs as an argument to model and that is going to give us the predictions of the model. So here we get back the same predictions as before. We've just done the same thing. We've just used a function right now. And let's compare these predictions with the actual targets. So remember that we've used the inputs here to make the predictions, but we've not really used the targets because our model simply takes inputs and gives predictions. So let's take the targets and compare them. And it seems like these are off the here we get a value of 20. Uh, but the prediction should be 56. Here we get 33. The prediction should be 70. Here we get minus eight. Not sure what that even means. And here we get minus 30. So a lot of the predictions of the model don't make sense. And there is a big difference between our models predictions and the actual targets. And this is expected because we've initialized our model with random weights and biases. So obviously we can't expect a randomly initialized model to just work, but we have a good starting point. Now we have a model. And the next thing that we need to do is to improve the model, but to improve the model, we need a way to evaluate how well our model is performing. And we can do that by comparing the models predictions with the actual targets. And you can compare them visually and say that they are bad, but that's not good enough. You need a way to com compare them mathematically. Ideally, it would be nice to reduce the whole thing to a single number. So how are we going to do that? So here's an idea. Let's take the predictions and let's subtract the targets from the predictions. So what that does when you have two matrices is that it's going to perform an element wise subtraction. So you get 20 minus 56, 33 minus 70. So for each element of this matrix, you know how far away that corresponding prediction is from the target, each of these individual predictions. Let's put that into a diff or difference matrix. And now you have some, we could take an average or something at this point, but the trouble is that there are some negatives and there are some positives and the average may come out to zero, but that does not mean the model is good. So to get rid of the negative numbers, we can simply say diff star diff. So take a square or an element wise square. Now re remember this time when we say star, we are doing an element wise multiplication, not a matrix multiplication. So we say diff star diff. And now what that has given us is all of these numbers have become positive. And this is just the scientific notation. E plus zero three means 10 to the power minus three. So this is 1.288 multiplied by 10 to the minus three, or sorry, 10 to the 10 to the power of three. If it was minus, it would be 10 to the power of minus three. And that simply means 1,288, 1288. All right. So that is your difference in the, the difference matrix. Now that's great. Now we have a pretty good idea and now we can probably take an average of these. So to take an average, the first thing you might want to do is take the sum and to take the sum of a matrix, we simply call torch dot sum. And that is going to take the sum and then we divide it by the number of elements. So the number of elements is 10, but you should never hard code this information because now let's say you go back and you're running this notebook again for a different number of regions with a different number of target or input variables. So what you want to do is you want to get the list of the number of elements. You want to get the number of elements in this diff matrix. And the way to do that is use the numel method diff dot numel. And that's going to give you the number of elements and torch tensors in this way, just as we see torch dot sum, this is a torch is a function for operating on tensors. There are hundreds of these. Similarly, tensors also have these methods. So for each specific tensor, you can invoke all of these methods to get information about the tensor, for example, the total number of elements. And this is a very important part of learning deep learning that you have to know what are all the different operations you need to perform and what are the functions to do them. Often anything that you want to do will be possible with just one or two lines of code, 
but you will have to search through the documentation for it or you can just ask on the forum. Okay, so now when we do the sum of the squares and then we take an average of that, that gives us a single number. So now the single number tells us how badly the model is performing. So this number is called the mean squared error. So we do, we calculate the loss between a difference between the two matrices, predictions and targets. Then we square all the elements of the difference matrix to remove negative values. And then we calculate the average of the elements in the resulting matrix. And this number is called the mean squared error. So now we take the, what we're going to do is define a function for mean squared error because we'll need to compute it a few times. And it does the exact same thing that we did line by line earlier. So we take T1 and we take T2. We, these will be predictions and targets respectively. So we take a difference between the two and then we do torch dot sum diff star diff. So square of the elements. And then we divide that the total sum of elements uh, of squares of elements by the number of elements in the matrix. Okay. So it's always a good idea to write functions. And whenever you see a function that you don't understand, take it apart. So use some example values, some example inputs and run it line by line. And that is a great part about Jupyter. You can type the code and you can experiment with it right here. You don't have to ask somebody what's going to happen or what happens inside this function. You just type the code and see what happens. So let's define the MSE loss function. And we can now use the MSE loss function with the predictions and the targets to get back what is called our loss. Now, what does this number represent? Since this is the mean squared error, now, if you work backwards, what that means is on average, each element in the prediction differs from the actual target by the square root of this number. So the square root of 3600 is about 60. And if that is the average difference, that is pretty bad considering that the numbers that we're trying to predict are themselves in the range of 50 to 200. So if the expected yield or the real yield is 60 and you're predicting 120, that's pretty bad that you're going to lose a lot of money with that model. Okay. And that is why this result is called a loss because it indicates how bad the model is at predicting the target variables. It indicates the, it represents the information loss in the model. So the lower the loss, the better the model. Okay. So now we have a loss and now we need to improve the model. We need to reduce the loss. And as I've said, right from the beginning, gradients play an important role here. And that is why if we scroll back up, to the point where we defined our weights and biases. Remember, these are the things that we've randomly initialized and these are the things that we need to change. So that is why we need to set requires grad equals to true here. So now we've set requires grad to true. And if you recall what this means is that you can go back, is that you can now run loss dot backward because loss is obtained by doing a mean squared error on predictions and targets. Predictions themselves are, by, are obtained by multiplying the weights matrix with the inputs and adding the bias. So the loss is ultimately a function of weights and biases and of course the inputs and targets as well. But the inputs and targets are fixed. We don't really want to change them. So the weights are what's important, what we're going to change. So the loss is a function of the weights and the biases. So when we run loss dot backward, because we have set requires grad to true in the weights and in the biases, if I simply print out W and W dot grad, you can see here that this is the weights matrix and W dot grad now contains a matrix of the same shape, but with different values. What do these values represent? This value represents the derivative of the loss with respect to this weight element. Now keep this in mind. A matrix is something that we have defined. It's just a human construct. We could simply have used numbers W1 to uh, w1112 and so on and we could still have done the same computation instead of using matrix multiplication we would have had to define all of these relationships so ultimately it is loss is a function of each of these individual weights and what this represents is the derivative of the loss with respect to this specific weight element and this is also called the partial derivative and so on but let's not worry about that similarly th the this element represents the derivative of the loss with respect to this specific weight element and so on. Okay. Similarly, if we print B and B dot grad, you will see a similar relationship here. B and B dot grad have the exact same shape. So this represents the uh, derivative of the loss with respect to this 
with respect to B. Now, okay, why have we done these derivative calculations? How is it useful? Now we are going to use the derivatives to adjust the weights and biases. Remember they were initialized randomly and now we are going to adjust them slightly to reduce the loss. And this is where we have to now apply a little bit of algebra and calculus. The loss is a quadratic function of our weights and biases because mean squared error performs a square. So anything that comes inside that formula gets squared and multiplied with other terms. So loss is a quadratic function of weights and biases. And this is what a quadratic function looks like, uh, roughly speaking. Now, this is not exactly a quadratic function uh, because a quadratic function only has one minima, one global minima. In this case, there are multiple. This, so this is more of a generalized polynomial. But I guess you get the point that the loss curve looks something like this with respect to any specific weight element. So what that means is if you take the element W1 and you change its value, if you make it really large, now what that is going to do is that is going to just make the lo loss really large. You set the weight to 10,000, the loss will become huge. Or if you make it really small, you set it to minus 10,000, it will get squared because there is squaring involved and the loss will once again become really large, right? So as the weights go from minus infinity to infinity, you on both sides, the loss increases and somewhere in between there is a nice region where the losses are low and there is a point where the loss is the lowest. Now with this picture in mind, let's think about what the gradient indicates. So the gradient of the loss or the derivative of the loss with respect to W11 indicates the rate of change of loss or geometrically speaking, it indicates the slope of the loss function. So if you pro plot the loss changes in loss or the value of loss, keeping all the weights constant and simply moving W11 around, simply changing that, this is the curve that you'll get. And at a specific point, the derivative indicates the rate of change or the slope. Now, what does that mean? If the derivative or the gradient element is positive, what that means is that the rate of change is positive. What that means is if you increase W11 slightly, then the loss will increase slightly. And if you decrease W11 slightly, then the loss is, decre is going to decrease slightly. And that's really all there is. No matter what values you started out with, when you compute the gradient and you look at the value of the gradient, whether it is positive or negative, whether to increase or decrease the weight, each individual weight. So if the gradient is positive, to increase the loss, you increase the weight. To decrease the loss, you decrease the weight. Now, obviously, we want to decrease the weight, so we are going to decrease the uh, we want to decrease the loss, so we are going to decrease the weight slightly. And similarly, if the gradient element is negative, so that means the rate of change is negative. This means that the slope is downward. The slope is decreasing. So in this case, we have the opposite relationship that increasing the weight slightly, for example, moving W21 to the right is going to reduce the loss and decreasing the weight slightly is going to increase the loss. Okay. Now this is really the only complex part of this entire exercise. So do go back and read this carefully and try to draw graphs on a piece of paper just to figure this out. Maybe review a lecture on calculus if you need to, but if you get this, you get the essence of gradient descent, taking random weights and using the gradients to identify how to adjust them slightly to reduce the loss. So we are going to use this and we are going to use it in this way. So now we have the weight and then we have the, let us just print the weight and the gradient of the weight. Here is the weights and here are the gradients of the weights. And now let's apply our logic. So we have point minus 0 0.271. This is W11 and it has the derivative of the loss with respect to W11 is minus 4,252. That's negative. That means the rate of change is decreasing. So if what we need to do is we need to slightly increase the weight element. Similarly, if the derivative was positive, we would need to slightly decrease the weight element. So there's a simple trick of doing this. What we do is we simply subtract the gradient from the actual weight. So we take 0.2761 and from that we simply subtract this. So what happens is if the, if the gradient is positive, then the weight element decreases. And if the gradient is negative, then the weight element increases because negative of negative becomes positive and you are actually adding when you're subtracting a negative number. Okay. 
So now we know that we subtract the gradient to increase or de uh, to decrease or increase the weight depending on whether it is positive or negative. So subtracting the gradient will give us a new weight which will have a which will lead to a lower loss because we are going downhill along the slope. We are descending along the gradient and that's why it's called gradient descent. But there's a problem here. The weight is 0.2 and we are subtracting four or, or in this case, we would be adding 4,252. So we are looking at this case. Now if the weight is 0.2 and you add 4,252, you're going to end up somewhere here way on the right. And the loss is going to be so large that you will have no way of recovering from that. What you need to do is you need to take small steps, right? You need to take a really small step, maybe just about 10% of the weights value or something like that. And that is where, we can use this, we can use this factor that when we are subtracting, so what we're saying is we're saying W minus equals W dot grad, and this is going to do an element wise subtraction. This is the same as saying W equals W minus W dot grad. So element wise subtraction. So when we are subtracting, we multiply four to five, two with 10 to the minus five, one E minus five. And what's the benefit of doing that? Now you can see that this is also in a similar range as these weights. So that when we do w minus w dot grad times one e minus five, these are the new weights that we get. So now we have gone from these weights to this new set of weights. Wherever gradient was negative, we have increased the weight slightly. And wherever gradient was positive, we have decreased the weight slightly. And each of these individual weights has contributed independently to decreasing the loss. So now we use the model again with the new weights, then the loss will be lower. Why? because of this. So this is how we do it. We say with torch dot no grad. Why do we say with torch dot no grad? Now remember PyTorch automatically keeps track of all of the calculations that you're doing so that whenever you call backward gradients are computed, that is an expensive operation. And sometimes it can have unintended consequences. Now what we want to do here is we want to actually use the gradients that are already computed to change the values of the weights. So we do not want to affect the gradients while the calculation is happening. We do not want to track this calculation. So we are simply telling PyTorch do not track this calculation or this computation for the purpose of automatic gradient computation. So we're done with all that. We just want to use the gradient right now. So we say put torch dot no grad and then we subtract from W W dot grad multiplied by a small number one E minus five. And this is also called a learning rate because this is the number that determines how big your steps are going to be, how fast your model is learning. And by fast, we don't mean a higher learning rate will mean that your model will train faster. In fact, a higher learning rate might mean that you will jump so far away that you never recover from it, right? So it's just the learning rate and you need to keep it in the right range so that you take small enough steps to get closer to the minimum point. Um, similarly, we are going to do B minus B dot grad and that's done. Now let's look at the weights, the new weights right now. Let's see W and B. So these are the new weights slightly changed, not too much. And these are the new biases. And let's now call, let's now make predictions using the model once again. So let's call the model, give it an input. So give it the inputs. So remember the model takes the weights and we've, since we've changed the weights, now it is going to use the new weights. So it takes the inputs, multiplies that with the weights matrix transposed and adds a bias. So once again, it performs a computation and gives us some predictions. Let's take those predictions here, put them in a variable just to make it clear. And let's take those predictions and put them along with the targets into the mean squared error and print the loss. And there you go. The loss is now 2819. So we went from a loss of, let's see here. We went from a loss of 3645, 3645 to a loss of 2819. And that's pretty good. We've already reduced it by 40% or so. And that's gradient descent for you. What we do is we simply take the gradients and descend along the gradients by subtracting a small quantity proportional to the gradient. And we'll just uh, say uh, formalize it a little bit and uh, do it once again. But before we proceed, one last thing that we need to do is we need to reset the gradients to zero. So remember W dot grad and B dot grad have the gradients of the loss with respect to these weights. Now, whenever we are done with all this gradient calculation, we simply need to tell PyTorch that we need to, uh, we are done with the gradients. Now we can remove the gradients, reset them back to zero. Otherwise what happens is the next time you calculate a loss and then the next time you call loss dot backward, 
it is going to keep adding to the gradients that are already there. This is just how PyTorch works. So whenever you're done with your gradient computation, simply call this zero method on the gradient. So w.grad.0 and b.grad.0. What that will do is now it will set the gradients back to zero. Okay. So that's how you improve the weights. That's how you adjust the weights of the model. Now, as we've seen, this is going to reduce the loss and improve our model. So this is what is called training the model using gradient descent. And it has these steps. Step one, generate predictions. You take the inputs, put them into the model that gives you predictions. Step two, calculate the loss, take the predictions and the targets and put them into the mean squared error function. And there are other options for error functions or loss functions, but we are going to use mean squared here. And that gives you the loss. Step three, compute the gradients. So we say loss dot backward and that gives us w dot grad and b dot grad. And step four and five is to adjust the weights and reset the gradients. So we adjust the weights by subtracting a small quantity proportional to the gradient w minus equals w dot grad multiplied by one e to the minus five. And then we also set the gradients back to zero. And we do all of this while informing PyTorch that we did not track all of these computations for the purpose of for the purpose of gradient calculation. We are done with that. So there we update the weights slightly and then we perform, we reset the gradients back to zero. And that gives us yet another new set of weights. So now I think you get the idea now each time for each weight, you are making a small downward descent along the stop along the gradient. And what that does is that reduces the loss. So now you can see the loss has become even lower. If we went from 2,800 to 2,200. Now it's straightforward what you need to do to get to the best possible model. So to reduce the loss further, we can simply repeat the process of adjusting the weights and biases multiple times. And each iteration is called an epoch. So let's train the model for hundred epochs. So we go for I in the range hundred one to hundred, uh, the exact same process, pass the inputs into the model, put the predictions and targets into a loss function, calculate the gradients using backward. And then with torch.nograd, set the gradients, uh, subtract a small quantity proportional to the gradient from each weight, and then set the gradients back to zero. And that will improve the loss. And really this is all that we are going to keep doing again and again over the course of six weeks with different models and different inputs and different data and different different loss functions primarily. The model will get more complex. The loss function will change. The data will change, but this will remain constant. And that is why it's so important to understand gradient descent and uh, linear regression. Okay. Once again, let's verify that the loss is now lower. This time we've done the process hundred times. So now the loss is far lower. It's only about 402. Now 402, what square root of 402? Let's see. So square root of 402 is about 20. That means our predictions are a lot closer to the targets. Now there you go. The predictions are 62, 67, which is quite close to 56 and 70. It's not perfect. Maybe you can go for another hundred epochs and see what happens, but it's getting pretty close and try running this notebook, try running for as many epochs as you can and see what is the lowest loss that you can get. So that was linear regression and gradient descent from scratch using matrix operations. We have understood every single operation that went in there. We understood the matrix multiplications that were happening. We saw how gradient descent is implemented. We did not calculate the derivatives ourselves, but if you just write out the formula on paper, I'm sure you can work out the derivative of the loss. You just expand the loss in terms of all the weights, numbers, the entire formula, and then take a derivative and then use those derivatives to create the gradient matrix. You can do that. But PyTorch does that for us, but we know how it works, right? So we know everything right now from the very basics, which is tensor operations, matrix operations on how to build gradient descent together. So let's save our notebook at this point. Once again, you install the Jovian library and run jovian.commit and that is going to save the notebook for us. Let me grab my API key here. Take my API key and put it into this input that takes this notebook and puts it on Jovian. And now you can go back and run this notebook from Jovian when you need to.
So jovian.commit uploads your notebook and you can view it later and you can continue your work and this will also be part of your profile so other people will be able to view it as well. So it becomes a portfolio of your data science projects. Now there's one question here. Why not do this using NumPy? As we saw earlier in the first tutorial, the reason for doing this is because the gradient computation can be done easily in PyTorch. We just call loss.backward. We did not have to implement it with NumPy. And the other reason is when we deal with larger data sets, we will have to move them to GPUs and NumPy does not support GPUs, but PyTorch does. Okay, so moving right along, we've implemented linear regression and gradient descent using the basic tensor operations primarily to understand it. But because this is such a common pattern in deep learning, PyTorch provides several built-in functions and classes to make it easy to create and train models with just a few lines of code. And we'll see, we'll do the exact same thing that we did but now we are going to use uh, the built-in functions in PyTorch. So let's begin by importing the torch.nn package from PyTorch and this contains all the utility classes for building neural networks. And that's a surprise, we are talking about linear regression, but it so happens that linear regression is actually the simplest form of a neural network. Okay, so as before we are going to represent the inputs and targets as matrices. So here we have an input matrix. This time instead of five regions we've gone with 15. And similarly, we have targets. These again, we have 15 targets for each of the 15 regions, yield of apples and oranges. And then we have the inputs and targets are converted from matrices, which is a NumPy to PyTorch tensors. So there you go. And you can look at the inputs here. Now we have inputs as PyTorch tensors. Now we're using 15 training examples because I want to illustrate how to work with large data sets in small batches. What you will often find in real world data sets is you will not have five or 15, but you will have maybe thousands or tens of thousands or even millions of data points. And when you're working with millions of rows of data, it will not be possible to train all of the, uh, train a model with the entire data set at once. It may not fit in memory, or even if it does, it may be really slow and it may actually just slow you down. So what we do instead is we take the data set and break it into batches. So we look at maybe five regions at once and we create three batches and we perform gradient descent with these batches. And that helps us train, train our models faster and fit our model training within the RAM that we have. So to do that, there are a couple of utilities we are going to use. First, we need to create a tensor data set. So we will import from torch.utils.data tensor data set. And then we will pass in the inputs and targets into tensor data set. And we'll put that into a train DS variable. And a tensor data set allows us to access inputs and targets, rows from the inputs and targets as tuples. So we have 15 inputs and 15 targets. And if we just pass in the range zero to three into tensor data, into train DS, what that's going to give us is the first three rows of inputs and the first three rows of targets. So this is a very simple class that simply lets you pick a slice of the data. It doesn't have to be zero to three, you can also, uh, pass an array of indices and get back a specific, uh, get back a tuple containing some specific rows from the data. And the first element here returned is the input variable and the second element are the targets for these input rows. Okay. Next, we will create a data loader and a data loader is what is going to split our data into batches of a predefined size. So we set the batch size to five. We think that should fit in our ramp, even 15, but just for demonstration, we are going to create batches of five. And then we put in the training data set into it, which is a tensor data set. We provide the batch size into data loader and we set shuffle to true. Now what is shuffle here? When you set shuffle to true, then the data loader before creating batches is going to create a random shuffle of the data. And let's see how that is used. So here I'm going to say for XB comma YB in train DL, and this is how you use a data loader. This is again, a nice thing about PyTorch that the classes and the objects that PyTorch provides are very Pythonic in the sense that they fit in very well with the kind of Python code you're already probably used to writing. So just as you iterate over a list or iterate over a dictionary or any other iterable object in Python, you can iterate over a data loader and the data loader gives you not individual elements or individual rows, but it gives you batches of data. It gives you a batch of inputs and a batch of outputs. So let's see that. Let's say for XP, YB in train DL, 
print the batch of inputs and print the batch of outputs and break out. So we are just going to look at the first batch. If you did not have this break, all three batches would get printed. So here is the first batch and let's compare that with the inputs. You can see that the first batch does not exactly use the first five rows of inputs. In fact, it has picked a random sample. And that is where shuffle equals true comes into picture that before creating batches, it's going to pick, it's going to shuffle the rows and then it is going to create batches. And each time you use it in a for loop, it's going to create a different set of rows. So if you just observe the first row here, it's going to change each time we call train DL. There you go. Now this shuffling helps randomize the input so that the loss can be reduced faster. It has been found empirically. And even if you reason about it, it makes sense. The more randomization that you include, the more, the faster your model trains. Okay. So that's our data loader. Now we know how to get batches of data. Next, we need to create the model. Now we had initialized our weights matrix and a bias vector manually with randomized values. And then we had defined a model function. But what we can do instead is use the nn.linear class from PyTorch. So the nn.linear, what is called a linear layer of a neural network, a teaser for what is going to come afterwards. A linear layer is nothing but a weights and a bias matrix bundled into this object, which can also be used as a function, right? So we create nn.linear and we give it the number of inputs so that we have three inputs, temperature, rainfall, humidity. So we give it the number of inputs and we give it two outputs. Uh, we are going to get two outputs out of it, which is yield of apples and yield of oranges. So that's going to create our model object for us. And when we pass in this, these numbers, it automatically creates a weight and a bias. So a weights matrix and a bias matrix. So let's check it out. So model dot weight has the exact same shape as the weights matrix we had created two rows and three columns and model dot bias has two elements. So it is a vector and both of these have requires grad set to true. So that's convenient. In just one line, we have instantiated the weights and biases with random values and they have required scratch set to true so that, so now you are not going to forget any of this. You just need to set nn.linear and nn.linear is just one form of a PyTorch model. There are many other modules available. You have nn.convolutional, which is what something, uh, something that we're going to see later. You can combine, you can have a layered structure. You can have a layered model, which has multiple models inside it. So that's why the model also has a parameters method model dot parameters. And this parameter method is going to, it can be used for any model to get the list of all the weights and biases matrices present inside it. Now in our linear n dot linear model, we just have one weights matrix and one bias matrix, the same thing that we saw here. But later on, we're going to see how there are multiple possible parameters. Uh, there's, there can be a huge list of parameters inside uh, the a model. Okay. So this is going to be useful for us. So remember the model dot parameters function and this model can be used to generate predictions in the exact same way as we had done before. So earlier we had defined a model function, which takes the inputs and it multiplies it with the weight transposed and adds the bias. That's the exact th same thing we can do here, pass the inputs into the model, use it as a function and that will give you predictions. So here you get 16 predictions or 15 predictions from the model. Now we know everything that's going on so far. Next, we are here at the loss function. Now, instead of defining the mean squared error loss manually, we can use the built-in function MSE loss. And this is present inside the torch.nn.functional package. The nn.functional package contains a lot of functions, especially loss functions, activation functions, and so on. So this is another important package and we normally import it as F. So here we define a loss function f dot MSE loss and we are simply going to use this loss function. We are going to pass in the predictions which we get from passing the inputs into the models and then we pass in the targets and that is going to give us the loss. So now this is the loss of this model. We know what the loss is except that this time we've used all the inbuilt things to create the model, create the loss and also represent the data. Next, we can now improve the model by performing gradient descent and we had performed gradient descent manually, but we can use what is called an optimizer in PyTorch to perform this, to perform the update of the weights and biases. So we are going to use the optimizer torch.optim.sgd. SGD stands for stochastic gradient descent, which indicates that the samples are selected in random batches instead of a group. So that's just the name of the algorithm stochastic gradient descent. 
and inside internally it performs the exact same thing that we have done which is subtracting from the weights and biases a small number proportional to the gradient of those uh, gradient of the loss with respect to those weights and biases okay and what we need to pass it is a list of parameters so the list of the weights and bias matrices that need to be updated and the learning rate and remember this learning rate is what we applied to reduce the gradient value to a, to something reasonable so that we take small steps and not very big steps so there you go now we have created the optimizer and now we are ready to train the model so we'll follow the exact same process as we had done before we need to generate new predictions calculate the loss compute gradients of the loss with respect to the weights and biases adjust the weights by subtracting a small quantity proportional to the gradient i hope you're getting bored of this by now because i this is it gets repetitive after a point but this is really what all it is uh, deep learning or machine learning and then we reset the gradients back to zero and to do this we will define a function this time because rather than typing it again and again it's just good to define a utility function and we'll keep using this function throughout the entire series so once we define it we'll just keep improving it adding small things here and there to make it better and better so that at by the end the same function will be used to train the models that you saw at the very beginning to produce images of handwritten digits and images of anime faces so we have this fit function which takes a certain number of epochs it takes the model it takes the loss function it takes the optimizer and it takes the training data loader so all the things that we've created so far and then for a given number of epochs so it repeats the process again and again it gets the batches of data and then it performs gradient descent get the predictions calculate the loss compute gradients update the parameters now here is an important thing instead of doing torch dot no grad op dot step etc etc we can we can simply call opt dot step and that is going to automatically update all of the weights and biases similarly we can say opt opt dot zero grad opt is the optimizer so opt dot zero grad is going to update the is going to reset the gradients back to zero and one last thing at the end of every epoch so for we go through the three batches for each epoch and at the end of each epoch we are simply printing the loss or actually at the end of every 10th epoch we are going to print the loss so let's run it now let's take the fit function give it a number of epochs the model the loss function the optimizer and the training data loader and you can see here we've gone down to a very small loss of 23 that's not bad let's generate some predictions using the model so this is the these are the predictions of the model and these are the targets you can see we have 56 57 70 71 81 and 80 101 and 99 that's pretty close and I don't know about you, but I find this really amazing. All we have done is said that there might be a linear relationship between temperature, rainfall, humidity, and crop yields. Then we said that it's going to be a weighted average, but we don't know the weight. So we initialize them randomly. Then we said, okay, let's figure out how badly the model is doing by calculating the mean squared error. And then we said, okay, what can we do to improve the weight so that the error becomes lower, the loss becomes lower gradients we can use gradients for each weight we can simply move down along the gradient to reduce the loss slightly so we did that for each weight and together it had a big, big effect and then we said maybe let's repeat that a hundred times and see what we get so we took hundred small steps along each of those loss curves and that led us to a low loss of what is that 23 and that led us to this model which gives us such accurate results and indeed these predictions are close um, to the targets and we've trained a reasonably good model to predict crop yields for apples and oranges so now we can go to a sixth region and let's say we know for the sixth region that the temperature average temperature is going to be 75 degrees fahrenheit the average rainfall is going to be 63 millimeters and the average humidity is going to be 44 percent relative humidity then we can take that create an input row out of it and then put that into a batch so we just create a, a fake batch of just one input row and create a tensor out of it so now we know what to do with this batch of inputs we simply put that batch of inputs into the model and we get back a batch of outputs so our model now predicts that in this sixth region we are going to have 53.6 tons per hectare of apples being produced and 68.5 tons of hectare of oranges being produced and this is exactly what happens in the real world. People take data, people train models, and then they use those models to make predictions. 
Now here I want to talk about the difference between machine learning and classical programming. So the approach that we have taken in this tutorial is very different from programming as you might know it. And that's why it's a different field of study. Even though we are writing code, something is different. Something's different. So usually we write programs that take some inputs. For example, you're calculating the square of a number. You take a number as input, then you perform some operations. So the operation you perform for square of a number is multiply the element by itself and then you return a result. And that's it. That's classical programming. So what you do is you take some rules that is your program and then you give some input to those rules and you get back some answers. So the rules are to multiply the number with itself. The input is a number and you get back the square of the number. But in this notebook, what we've done is we've defined a model. All the model does is rather than tell you exactly how to get the output from the input. It says that the outputs and the inputs may have a certain relationship. Uh, the yield of apples may be, I'm guessing the yield of apples has some linear relationship with the temperature rainfall and humidity, but I'm not sure what the weights for that linear relationship should be. So there, there is a model which defines a certain structure or a relationship and some unknown parameters, which are the weights and biases. What we then do is we show the model some known inputs. So we show the model that, Hey, when this is the, uh, these are, when these are the temperature rainfall humidity, this should be the output and so on. So we show it uh, the same number of inputs and then we train the model to come up with good values for these unknown parameters. And once the model is trained, it can be used to compute outputs for new inputs, just, like, just like a normal program. So in some sense, what we've done is we've taken the data, and we have taken the answers to the data. So we've taken the inputs and the outputs and we've shown that to a model. Now model simply has a structure or some relationship. We've shown that to a model using which the model has learned some parameters and use and those parameters combined with the structure of the model is now what gives us a rule. So in some sense, the model is writing a program. Now that program is not expressed using statements as we know it, but that program is expressed in terms of numbers, in terms of weights. And that's really all it is. All of machine learning is about showing some data and some answers about the, those data to a model. And there are different kinds of models and coming up with parameters or rules, which can then be used to make predictions on new data. Okay. And this paradigm of programming is, this is what is machine learning. And deep learning is a branch of machine learning that takes, that uses matrix operations and nonlinear activation functions and gradient descent and all of these things that we are learning about to build and train models. And it's a really powerful technique that has such widespread applicability in so many different areas. So Andre Karpathy, the director of AI at Tesla Motors, he has written a great blog post on this topic called Software 2.0 and how artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning are completely transforming how we build software and what are all the new possibilities that they enable. So do check out this blog post for sure. So keep this picture in mind. Just let me hold on to it for a second. Keep this picture in mind while you go through this entire tutorial series, while you're building your own models and see how it is different from the programming that you've already done. Okay. So as a final step, we can record a new version of the notebook using the Jovian library. We just call jovian.com it once again on zero to linear regression. And that has recorded a new version of the notebook. And you can open up the notebook on Jovian on your Jovian profile and access it there. One thing that you can also see as you record multiple versions is you can see visually what are the differences between your versions. Let me quickly show you that. So what you can do is go to the notebook page and you can see the versions here and there's an option to view a diff. So you can just click view diff. You can see what has changed between specific versions and this even shows visual changes. So if there is a change within the graphs, you will see that as well. All right. We've learned linear regression and gradient descent in this tutorial. Now, if you stay till the end, I will show you a couple more interesting things at the very end of this uh, tutorial. So we are going to talk about the assignment next, but at the end, I'm going to just show you a small trick to go from linear regression to deep learning. And here are some resources that you can check out. So there's a visual and animated explanation of gradient descent that you can watch. So you can click through and watch that. There's also some, if you prefer reading notes and math, then there are also some notes from a Udacity course you can watch. For an animated visualization of how linear regression works, you can check out this post. And then depending on how deep you want to get, you can also check out 
some course notes from the course taught at Stanford University on the exact same topic of matrix calculus and linear regression and gradient descent. But to practice your skills, you can try participating in competitions on Kaggle, a website that hosts data science competitions, but don't sweat it right now. We will be giving you assignments to work on. You will be building your own models. So don't worry about it. And at the end, here are some questions for review. Do go through these questions. Once you work through the notebook, just spend five to 10 minutes on these questions. There will certainly be something where you feel a little unsure. And these questions are for you to test your understanding. These are not graded, but this will help you fill the gaps in your understanding. If you see a question that does not make sense, try to come up with a good answer or try to rewatch the video, try to scroll up and find the right place within the notebook where you can get the answer to this question. So that's linear regression. Next, let us come back to the lesson page here. And if you go back to the course page, you will see assignment one. So I mentioned to you, you can earn a certificate of accomplishment by completing this course. So what you need to do to complete this course is work on three assignments and build a course project. These three weekly assignments, the first of these is all about torch.tensor. And the objective of this assignment is to build is for you to build a solid understanding of PyTorch tensors. So what you will do in this assignment is you will pick five interesting functions related to PyTorch. You need to go through, you need to go through this page here. This talks about all the functions available in the torch module. A lot of these functions apply directly to tensors. So just pick five functions. Please don't pick the first five, pick five interesting ones, pick maybe five related to trigonometry or linear algebra or statistics or anything that you like. And then there's a starter notebook here. You can click through and view the starter notebook. Now you know how to run this notebook. You go here and click run on collab and that's going to run the notebook for you. Yeah, you run the notebook here and then you pick five interesting functions. For example, let's say I am picking torch.cat. So what you need to do is give your notebook an interesting title. If you're picking a topic, say five interesting trigonometry functions in PyTorch or let's say all about PyTorch tensor operations, five PyTorch tensor operations you didn't know you needed, try to pick something unique, something interesting. Give it a nice title, give it a short, write a short introduction about PyTorch and the chosen functions, the list of the functions, and then work through this notebook. So the first function you talk about change, you need to change this. This is an example. So change torch.tensor to an actual function, add some explanation about the function. Then you need to give three examples of the function. So example one shows a simple use case of the function, a simple usage, maybe give, give it one or two parameters and then show another example, uh, include some explanation about the example as well. Then show another example, example two. Example two can be a little more complex. Try to introduce some variety, try to change some of the arguments and share some explanation about that example. And then example three should be a breaking example. So here you should illustrate when a function breaks. So maybe give it some kind of an improper input and that will lead to an error. Try to produce an error. That's a very interesting way of learning. Try to produce an error and then figure out if the error is what you expected. Then what you should be doing is explaining what went wrong here. Okay, so two working examples and one failing example. And then finally some closing comments on when this function might be used. So just use uh, the way to edit it is just double click on a cell and you can change the explanation. You can use markdown. So markdown is very simple. All you need to do if you want to create a heading is just put a hash and start typing. You can see here on the side, you just Google markdown and you learn the syntax. So that's function one. And then after each function, continue, just keep committing your notebook, commit to zero one tensor operations, then go with function two and function three and so on. Keep going function five. So you need to write five functions and three examples for each function and then write a small conclusion about what you covered in this notebook and then share some reference links like the official documentation for tensor operations. If you found some other useful tutorials online, you can share those links as well. Feel free to share the link of this course. So what we're doing here is one, you're learning about PyTorch tensor operations, which we will be using extensively over the next few weeks. So by just by going through the documentation, you will not feel lost when we use some of these advanced operations. Second, you're learning how to present something that you've learned. And presentation is a very important part of data science and machine learning because unlike software where you build a website and somebody uses the website in machine learning, what you have to do is present your findings to a team 
or often you have to present it to stakeholders who may not have the same kind of technical knowledge that you do product managers executives end users so it's very important for you to be able to explain what you have done or and explain it in simple words so try to keep the words simple try to explain it to somebody who does not know any of it make it as beginner friendly as possible okay and at the end you need to run jovian.commit and when you run jovian.commit that will give you this link so now this will get saved on your profile here this is my profile similarly you will see it on your profile then grab the link from your profile and this part is important you need to grab the link come back here and paste the link here so you need to paste the link here into this make a submission form and then click submit and when you click submit a submission will be recorded you'll be able to see your submission history here and then over the course of the next few days we will be performing the evaluations and to receive a pass grade in this assignment so you will either receive a pass or a fail grade the submitted link should be a jovian notebook that is publicly accessible the notebook should demonstrate at least five tensor functions there should be at least two working examples and one failing example for each function and then the jupyter notebook should also contain proper explanations so not just code and all the cells of the notebook should be executed showing proper outputs okay so just make sure just review this evaluation criteria especially if you receive a fail grade and then there are some more links here that you can follow so that's the assignment one it is due in two weeks from now so you have some time for that but i will recommend doing it as soon as possible this should not take more than a couple of hours maybe a little longer if you want to spend some time browsing through the documentation but after that we will also highly recommend and this part is optional this is not part of the grading but we highly recommend writing a blog post on medium if you have not written a blog post ever this is a great time to write a blog post the reason for that is writing a blog post gives you a nice way to summarize what you've learned into a small publicly accessible write up and this is something that you can share with you can share with your friends this is something that you can share with potential employers and they will be able to see your presentation skills and this is something that will be useful for you when you need to revise these topics and a lot of other people who are just one step behind you so we recommend going to medium.com so you can go to medium.com and sign in to medium.com and create a post now you when when you need to include code within your blog post you can actually include it by using the embed option from jovian so if you go back to a jovian notebook you can simply click there is a embed option here embed cell and you can simply copy this link of an embed cell and paste it within medium and that is going to embed the cell for you so within your blog post you will be able to see you will be able to see a notebook a piece of a notebook one cell from a notebook hosted on jovian and this is a nice way to include inputs and outputs within your code and you can click view file anybody who is reading your blog post can click view file to go and find the entire uh, file go and see the entire code okay so do write a blog post so that's one part of it and the next thing is to go and share your work with the community so we have given this link here to this forum page come to this forum page function uh, pytorch functions and tensor operations hit the reply button and just share the link to your blog post just say this is your blog post this is what it is about uh, you can share your blog post if you have written one or you can just share your jupyter notebook and over time we will see that hundreds of people have shared their work on this thread and what you will be able to do is look through the blog posts and notebooks written by other people so that you learn not just the five tensor functions that you have created but you get to learn maybe 100 other tensor functions and that's a great way to learn it's a crowd sourced way of learning somebody is doing all the hard work of coming up with great examples and simple explanations and you can just spend a minute and learn about it okay so please make use of uh, the community here make use of all the resources available here if you ask if you have any questions you can ask questions on the forum so there is a discussion thread here you can click on continue discussion and ask a question here about the assignment so that's the assignment now one other thing i want to tell you about is the jovian mentorship program now you can earn the certificate of accomplishment that you want for this course that is completely free of cost uh, when you do the three assignments and the course project you will get it uh, but if you are looking for more one to one guidance then we have 
what is called the Jovian mentorship program where you can get access to a private Slack group. This is a very limited Slack group with the course team. And we also have weekly office hours on zoom. This is also part of the mentorship program and you can get one-on-one -on -one guidance for your project. All this as part of this program. And this is a limited and paid program just to help you get the most out of this course. And you can apply for it here and we will be reviewing some applications. You can apply for it on jovian.ai slash mentorship and we will be reviewing your applications and getting back to people. This is just something to keep in mind if you need more guidance. So we've looked at PyTorch basics and gradient descent linear regression. In lesson two, we will be looking at how to work with images and how to perform logistic regression on images. That's going to be our next topic. Very interesting in many ways, very similar to what we've done right now, but the results we will produce and the data we will use will be very different. Next, we will go from linear and logistic regression. We'll go one step for forward and create feed forward neural networks. And as I told you in the, in between, I will show you a quick trick to convert your linear regression model into a feed forward neural network right at the very end of this. So stick around for that. Then for lesson four, we will have convolutional neural networks. So we will learn about special types of neural networks, which are no longer these linear layers or these weights, multiplications of matrices. They are slightly more special and they are well suited for working with image data. So they provide many benefits for working with image data. We learn about convolutional neural networks. Next, we will learn about advanced convolutional networks called residual networks, which perform certain improvements to convolutional networks, improve the network architecture a little bit. We will also use tricks like regularization and data augmentation to create a state of the art model. So we will train a state of the art deep learning model on a huge data set with tens of thousands of images in less than five minutes. So this lesson is pretty exciting. And finally, lesson six is where we will put everything that we have learned together to create gen generative adversarial networks where we will be training models that can generate images of handwritten digits or generate images of faces. And you will be able to apply the things you've learned in any of these lessons to create your course project. And you will be able to apply them on a whole variety of data sets, probably tens of thousands of data sets that you can find online. So we will actually share a list of data sets with you from where you can find inspiration for working on projects. And we saw thousands of great projects last time and we're hoping to see many more this time as well. And that is how it will go. So what should you do next? You need to review the lecture video and run the Jupyter Notebook on Colab. You need to complete the assignment and share your work and exchange feedback and participate in the forum discussions and join a study group near you if possible. So you can just get together with five friends and join a study group with them. Or you can find a study group on the community as well. Now, as I promised, I'm going to go back to the linear regression notebook and show you how to take this linear regression model that we have defined so far and turn it into a machine learning, uh, into a deep learning model or a feed forward neural network. So let me just add a few code cells. All I'm going to say here is I'm going to create model two. And this time, instead of, instead of using nn.linear, I'm going to use nn.sequential. And inside nn.sequential, I'm going to put in nn.linear where we take three inputs, temperature, rainfall, humidity, and then we convert it into four outputs. Why four? Because we only have two outputs, apples and oranges, yields. Let's convert it into four, four outputs. Then we are going to use what is called an activation function, nn.relu or nn.sigmoid. And we'll learn about this next week, the activation. What is an activation function? What does it do? And then we are going to put in nn.linear once again. And this time we're going to take these four outputs and convert them into two out or four. So we're going to take the outputs of the first linear layer. So now we're calling these layers and we're taking the outputs, the four outputs of the first linear layer and converting them into two outputs. Okay. And you can change this number. This can be four and four, five and five, three and three. It doesn't matter. So what this is called is this one layer is called a hidden layer now, and this is called an activation function or a non-linearity. So now we've a matrix multiplication. Then we have this non-linearity, not sure what that is. We learn about it. And then we have this NN dot linear layer, which is the, which is, which is called the output layer. So that's model two. Let's create an optimizer for this model. 
So torch dot optim dot sgd, and we are going to give it the parameters of the model. So model two dot parameters, and let's experiment with the learning rate. Let's say one e minus four. Okay. So we've just changed two lines here. We've gone from a single n n dot linear model to a n n dot sequential, which is saying that take the linear output, pass it into sigmoid, take the sigmoid output, pass it into another linear, and now we can use the exact same fit function that we have used before. So now I am going to train it for a hundred epochs. I'm going to pass it this new model two. I'm going to pass in the loss function, the same loss function f dot m s e loss. I am going to pass in the optimizer, the new optimizer that we just defined, and the same training data. So nothing has changed, right? Uh, to go from linear regression to training a deep learning model, it's just these three additional lines of code, and then we fit it, and you can see here that the model is now training, and it seems like the model is training slightly slowly. So maybe we can increase the learning rate a little bit, and it continues to train and gets better and better. Okay, so now that is. that's that's your machine learning that's your deep learning model roughly speaking what that does and we'll discuss this in a lot more detail over the next few weeks but roughly speaking what that does is it takes these three inputs temperature rainfall and humidity and converts it into three intermediate inputs so now we've performed a matrix multiplication and gotten three outputs intermediate outputs out of it then we take these intermediate outputs and run them through this sigmoid function what does the sigmoid function do it's very simple function it takes the values that are given to it each individual value so let's say you have three outputs so you you have three intermediate outputs you pass them into sigmoid and you'll get back three more outputs only difference is sigmoid squishes the outputs from a wide range into a 0 to 1 range so it does that by applying this non linear function if your output is a large negative value it becomes close to 0 and if your output is a large positive value it becomes close to 1 Now sigmoid is not the only way to do it you can also apply a nonlinear activation function to do this uh, so another nonlinear activation is relu now relu is a lot simpler than sigmoid what we do is we simply say that okay if an output is positive then we retain it if an output is negative or if one of the inputs given to relu is negative it simply replaces it with a zero okay so we take these intermediate outputs and apply this nonlinearity and then we put multiply with another weights matrix and add the biases and give out the outputs now what has changed the thing that has changed is instead of having a linear relationship between the inputs and the outputs we have now assumed that there is some amount of non linearity in the relationship so we have made the model more powerful now our model has more parameters and our model has these ways of learning a non linear relationships again we will talk about this in more detail later but just by doing just my is making this model more powerful introducing non linearity we have made it more likely to fit the data better because now it can capture not just linear relationship but also slightly non linear relationships and as relationships get more and more non linear and more and more complex we may need more layers in the model and we may need more uh, we may need bigger layers as well so we may need instead of getting three intermediate outputs we may need to get 100 intermediate outputs and so on okay but the way we train it is the exact same way which is gradient descent and that is really what is the essence of deep learning uh, how to train models so that's neural networks for you with that i will see you in the forums you can follow us on free code camp jovian ml or you can follow me on akash nn the next lesson is working with images and logistic regression do subscribe to the channel so that you get notified it shows up on your feed and if you like this tutorial do hit that like button and leave a comment thank you and have a good day or good night